Welcome to another wonderful episode of Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. I am so excited to have our guest today. It is a, just an incredible pleasure to have Gino Wickman with us. He is the founder of EOS Worldwide and the creator of EOS, which I've been hearing just a ton about from my friends in Strategic Coach in Genius Network. It's changed so many businesses. Gino has been an entrepreneur since age 21. He's author of some amazing books. He's author of the award-winning best-selling book, Traction, Get a Grip on Your Business, which I have right here. Look at that. This is an incredible book. Highly yeah. recommend it. All about EOS, Entrepreneurial Operating System. He's also author of Get a Grip, Rocket Fuel, How to Be a Great Boss, and What the Heck is EOS? And he's author of the brand new book, Entrepreneurial Leap, which I have right here in my hand, and that's what we're going to be talking a lot about. We'll cover EOS and how that can transform an existing business as well, but if you are on the precipice of maybe starting your own venture, maybe circumstances have kind of pushed you into that place, you are in for a treat because you're going to learn all the essential traits and all the tools that you'll need in this episode today. Gino, it's so great to have you on the show. Glad to be here, Stefan. So let's, first of all, talk a, a little bit about EOS. Many of our listeners will not have even have heard of it before. I hadn't heard of it before, let's say, two years ago. So what is it, and why is it such a game changer? <laughs> well, so it stems from 10 years of obsessing about entrepreneurs and businesses taking over a family business, doing a turnaround, running that business, selling that business, getting involved in the Young Entrepreneurs Organization, and getting involved in the Strategic Coach. And so it's all these data points that came together. Upon transitioning out of the business, the family business I sold, I then took a leap once I realized what my true God-given abilities were, and that's helping entrepreneurs. And so I set out to help entrepreneurs, took all of that experience, and over a five-year period, I developed EOS, which is known as the Entrepreneurial Operating System. And so what it is, is it is an operating system, the original operating system uh, for a business for orchestrating and harmonizing human energy. And, and so what it is, is it's a system that helps an entrepreneur and their leadership team run a better business. The typical sweet spot is a 10 to 250 person privately held company. That's where about 80% of our clients reside. Uh, we've got almost 100,000 companies using those tools. As you shared, I've written five books around it. They've sold over a million copies. And so we're just putting a huge dent in the entrepreneurial universe, helping people run better businesses. And so at the end of the day, that's what it does. It manages the human energy in your organization, helping you to run a better business. Yeah. And and I can, uh, I can vouch for how it's changed many businesses because... Not only have many of my friends implemented EOS and gotten a lot of uh, value out of it, but some of my clients have too. And, and in fact, uh, one of them, uh, a border buddy, they uh, relaunched their website with my help. I uh, was spearheading that whole project, but they wanted to make sure that they talked about EOS in their about page because it was mm. so transformational. Incredible. So they've got a picture of, of uh, the book cover traction on their mm -hmm. about page and a whole write-up about how transformational it was for their business. It, it's one of their milestones on their timeline on, on their about page. Yeah, and it's just so crazy to hear that. You know, I mean, it's a, and it's a dream come true. You know, we've got cities now when an employee is looking for a job, they'll only work for a company running on EOS. I mean, it's the, how crazy is that? You know, so I... I certainly expected that many companies would run on that system and we'd change a lot of lives. I did not expect, you know, what's what's the reach that we've had and and the reach that we're going to achieve over the next 10 years. Right. In fact, some of the people who have uh, interviewed for jobs working for me have said, oh, I'm an uh, integrator or whatever uh, yeah. in, in EOS. And so I'd be a perfect fit in this w the way yeah. and, and, and so forth. Amazing, right? You so, so amazing. You, know, you have changed the, day, the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I get too much credit. At the end of the day, all I am is this obsessive guy that all I do is focus on how to make an entrepreneur's life better. 
And, and again, I spent those five years working with 50 companies, 500 sessions, and I just listened to all their problems. I also have an ability to simplify. And so I just take the 2080 approach to the world and figured out the 20% that will get a company 80% of the results, put that into a simple set of 20 tools. And so far it's working. I created it to be timeless. Hopefully it'll still be around in a hundred years, but so far 20 years in running, it's still alive and well. Yeah, that's great. And and I bet these tools are very instrumental, helpful for folks who are having to downsize or pivot in various ways because of the economic downturn, because of the pandemic. So uh, you're helping business owners be resilient and, and dare I say, even anti-fragile and being able to thrive in times of strife and trouble like this. Yeah. I love that word and I love that book. So that's near and dear to my heart in that we helped a lot of companies through 08 and 09 and we're about to do it again. And so you're right. I mean, the, the, the companies that are running on the system, you know, are surviving and thriving. It's all about going back to the basics right now. Everybody's got to get, got to get back to the basics. We've had this incredible 11 year run. And so all the entrepreneurs that were spawned in 08 and 09 don't know tough times. And so they're all getting a wake up call and it's, Get back to the basics, everybody. So that would be humble two sons. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what would be an example of the 20 tools that would be especially helpful for somebody who already runs a business and is facing things like potential layoffs and uh, cost-cutting measures, cutting back on their marketing spend, perhaps those sorts of things? Yeah. And it's so, you know, all 20 tools are very powerful on their own. Uh, Five of those tools we consider the foundational tools. And so I wish I could give the perfect answer because every company out there is experiencing something different mm -hmm. because this one is really unusual in that in 08 and 09, it was most companies that, that you know we had to help really turn the corner. Right now, all of the clients and companies and entrepreneurs that I talk to right now, it's this interesting 50-50. 50% are thriving. They're in the right place at the right time and, it's, and they're in a really good spot. 50% are getting their ass kicked. So it really depends who we're talking to. And it also depends how extreme it is. But like one thing we're helping companies do that have experienced, let's say a 50% drop in revenue and they have to do layoffs. They have to do layoffs for survival, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So there's a tool we teach called accountability chart. And, and again, most of the good years, it's all about anticipating growth, putting the right structure in place to get you to the next level. Well, with accountability chart, in times like this, with somebody that takes that kind of a hit, we teach reverse accountability chart. And you mentally have to shift your brain. And it takes a team an hour. And so we're working on them for an hour, getting their brain into survival mode. And you've got to do a reverse accountability chart. you got to look at, OK, this was the structure for 10 million in revenue. What's the structure for 5 million in revenue? And they just have to rethink. And you know, there are leaders that are having to do jobs they used to do eight years ago when it was a $5 million company. So, it's, so that would be one example of a tool. But certainly meeting with your team, we teach a level 10 meeting, very powerful meeting where the team comes together, focuses on what's important. And I could keep going. I wish I could pick the perfect one. Um, <laughs> That's fine. But there are a lot of them. Yeah. Well, so I Clearly, our, our listener needs to go check out uh, Traction and your other uh, books about EOS and maybe even hire an EOS consultant to help them because you've got a whole worldwide network of them, right? Yeah, we call them EOS implementers, and there are 350 all over the world. Yeah, that's great. Now, the reverse accountability uh, chart and tool, that sounded very similar to something I just learned from Shannon Susco. Do you know who Shannon Susco is? I uh, no, she's the, the the creator of of the concept of the three hag, you know the three hag three year hot highly achievable goal. So okay. there's the B hag, the oh yeah, you know, Jim Collins's uh, uh, oh, yeah. big hairy audacious goal, but the three year highly achievable goal or three hag is something that uh, people can kind of wrap their heads around because it's no, not too far in the future, like five years and. It's not right around the corner, like one year. So you're not just kind of in fi uh, fight or flight or firefighting mode uh, with, uh, with the one year. And you just make it very achievable. So that sounded great. I had her on my show. I talked to her about her books and her concepts. And one of the concepts that has been just hugely valuable for me, I've been going through this exercise myself, is starting from the bottom up and figuring out if you have no cash left 
I mean, if you have no clients left, if everybody goes away, what happens in terms of your cash over you know the next period of weeks or months? When do you run out of cash? So what are your days of cash that you have left? And then if only your very best clients, your most loyal, most resilient clients to this economic downturn stay with you, what kind of expenses do you have? What kind of uh, skeleton crew do you have, et cetera? And then one level up, what if my next uh, most loyal clients uh, stay and you know, are not quite as resilient, but maybe cut back a bit, but they stay? You know, What kind of revenue and what kind of expenses? And then just work your way up because going from the top down, making cuts, and then figuring out what your business is going to have to be like Without, let's say, 10% of your staff, which 10% do I lay off, et cetera? And then, oh, what if things get even worse? And then I go 20% into my uh, into layoffs and so forth. Psychologically, that is so hard. And we just procrastinate that. We don't want to do it. And I didn't want to do it. I mean, I've, I've lost my three biggest accounts in the last month. Mm. It is so painful. Sure. So I have... To, been I've been delaying what kind of cost cutting measures do I need to do now I have this methodology to start from the bottom work my way up it sounds uh, somewhat similar to your reverse accountability chart what do you think yeah definitely it's in that same vein the the three heg as you describe it's very much in alignment with our philosophy in that you know for 20 years we've been teaching three year picturing and so we teach people how to create a three year picture for the organization hmm. so very similar and so yeah it sounds like uh, she knows what the heck she's talking about. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's start moving into this conversation around folks who want to uh, make that leap, become an entrepreneur. Per perhaps they have an activating event, <laughs> like a layoff that has pushed them to this point, and they need to see if they've got the, the gumption to do it and the tools and, and, and the, the resources and the resourcefulness. <laughs> of course, you got this great book. How how do we tell them to assess with whether they've got the chops for this or not? Yeah, that's awesome. And so let me create a little context as we now shift into this new project. And I want to go back and the last 30 years of my life, three decades of obsessing about helping entrepreneurs has led me to write this new book and create this new project. And the project in a nutshell is to help a million entrepreneurs in the making get a huge jump start on taking their entrepreneurial leap and greatly increase their odds of success. And there's an old saying by Daniel Kenyon that says, we teach what we needed the most. And basically what I'm doing is I'm teaching my 18 year old self who was an entrepreneur in the making, who was lost, confused, insecure. I was a mislabeled derelict. And at the end of the day, I was this entrepreneur in the making and I didn't know it. It took me until age 29 to realize that I was an entrepreneur in the making. And so as I was building EOS Worldwide over the last 20 years, when I was 40, I said, once I turn 50, I'm going to focus on entrepreneurs in the making. I'm going to go to the front end of the entrepreneurial journey and help these people. And so that was at 40. I'm now 52. Two years ago, I turned 50. I actually sold EOS Worldwide. So I sold the company. I still own 12.5%. I still own all the books. I'm still the EOS guy. I still have clients. Half my working life is still EOS but this is where my next passion is. And so with that, what I've done is I've created content, put it all in a book and tools on the website that basically takes someone who thinks they might be an entrepreneur in the making and takes them on a journey of discovery to decide. And so for your audience, you have people that are sitting there that may be wondering if they're an entrepreneur in the making or thinking about taking their leap. This book is perfect for them. You may have people in your audience that are business owners, current, very successful entrepreneurs, and they have a passion for helping entrepreneurs in the making. They mentor them or they have an organization that helps them. Or they have somebody in their life, a child, a, a, a nephew, a niece that appears to be exhibiting signs of entrepreneurship. This book is for them. And then there's one little ancillary benefit I had never anticipated, but when a successful entrepreneur reads this book, uh, it lights them up because what you're going to read is your life story. And what it does is it kind of reinvigorates your entrepreneurial spirit and you will literally make two or three course corrections on the path you're on. So it's a kind of a cool exercise for somebody even in that state. But all that said, what I do with this content is there are three parts to the book. 
It's called Confirm, Glimpse, and Path. And if you understand that, there's kind of a linear fashion to that. And so confirm is all about first and foremost, confirming that the person is even an entrepreneur in the making in the first place. And we can come back to that. But a true entrepreneur in the making, a true entrepreneur has six essential traits. And we can come back to that. Mm -hmm. Second part of the book then takes them to glimpse. Let's assume we've confirmed that they're an entrepreneur in the making. Now we're going to light them up by showing them a glimpse of what life looks like as an entrepreneur all of their options. I show them a day in the life, countless real world stories, and then that really motivates them to move. And then we go to the third part of the book, which is path. And path is where I show the path, guideposts, milestones on the journey to greatly increase their odds of success and to help them avoid half the mistakes they're about to make. They'll still make the other half. It's all part of the process and the learning process. But that's the content in a nutshell. And we can obviously go wherever you want to go. But in answering your question you just asked there, I'll start there now that hopefully the context is clear to your audience. Mm. And so when we say confirm and we talk about those six essential traits, in all of my experience, all of my research, having done this now for 30 years and then testing it on every entrepreneur, there are six essential traits of every true entrepreneur. Very quickly, they are visionary, passionate, problem solver, driven, risk taker, and responsible. And what I urge your listener to do is just kind of do a little checkup on themselves. Uh, if they are an entrepreneur, do a checkup on themselves if they're thinking about being an entrepreneur. I offer a free assessment. There's an assessment in the book and I offer a free assessment on the website. And so they can go to e-leap.com for that assessment. And all of that is around deciding, am I cut out for this thing? Because the passion and the message there is I'm trying to talk people out of doing this if they don't have the six essential traits. I'm tr I, I believe I'm doing a service. It is going to break some hearts, I know, but I'm trying to save someone 10 years of sheer hell if this is not what they're supposed to be doing. And just as quickly, I'm trying to find all the entrepreneurs in the making that exist in the world. I believe 4% of the world exhibits these traits, has these traits. You're born with them. They cannot be taught. It is nature over nurture. And, and I want to find that 4% wherever they are. In college, working in the corporate world, in inner cities, wherever the heck they are, I want to find them and help them become the reason they were put on this planet and become what they were born to be. Wow. So how did you come up with 4%? I, it's, it stems from the research Mark Winters and I did in our book, Rocket Fuel. And so a lot of your listeners might be familiar with the concept I created called Visionary Integrator, a discovery I made. And, and, and we now help a lot of businesses run on that concept. So that visionary is that entrepreneur that founded the company typically needs to be counterbalanced with an integrator. So anyway, our research around visionary and talking to a lot of experts, we found the number to be about 4%. And then a little fun fact, I'm on a little bit of a tangent, we'll come back, is only about 1% of the world are integrators. So that's a really interesting, huge opportunities for the integrators of the world. But nonetheless, that work comes from that discovery. And so it seems to be 4% and that's been validated a few times over, but at the end of the day, these are my opinions, my research, you know, my three decades, you know, love it or not. <laughs> well, when you explain the integrators and how uh, they can kind of set their own uh, path because they're so rare and, and valuable, that explains mm -hmm. why he was, t this guy that I interviewed, uh, who also is a friend, why he was touting yeah. so much that he's an integrator in EOS. Here, 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 gotcha. here. Okay. There it goes. So I, I'm definitely a visionary. I, I need an integrator. I, uh, I've i got some great team members, but I don't have that uh, that, that special person, that integrator that, that I need to have in order to really expand the business. And here's another thing, too, is I've, I've come to realize in the 25, 20, yeah, 25 ish years that I've uh, been owning, running, founding businesses. Uh, so I did have a successful exit and stuff. This is my second, well, I've got two companies right now. So I'm on my second run right now, but I've found that running a business, let's say, you know, five, six, seven million dollar business is not, yeah, that I'm hard, I, that's hard for me. <laughs> I'm not that good at that. I need to have a CEO, or at minimum a COO, somebody who's got the chops to help me do that, because I can grow something from nothing 
to mm-hmm. seven figures and low seven figures, no problem. But yeah, yeah I, it is. You you said so much there that I, I, I want to go in three different directions. Okay, and, let's and do I, it. <laughs> and I, I won't, and I'll let you rein me in. But it's so interesting, you know, what you shared there, because. Again, if I, I if I can continue to have your audience understand the context of confirm glimpse path, you know, you touched on two very important things: one in path and one in glimpse. And so, let's just pretend for the sake of this conversation, you know, everyone listening understands how to confirm that you're an entrepreneur in that whole piece of the book. When you talk about this visionary integrator concept and the need for an integrator. In PATH, you know, I'm teaching the nine stages of growing your business. And one of those stages is where you have to make a conscious choice as to when you need to hire or bring on your integrator. And it's a different answer for every entrepreneur. And I believe every visionary entrepreneur should have one. There's only 5% of the visionary entrepreneurs have the ability to do both. And so if you really want to expedite your growth, get an integrator. But sometimes economically, you can't afford that. And so what I talk about and I teach is some entrepreneurs are able to and are savvy enough and can afford right on the front end to either partner with an integrator, hire an integrator. It's exactly what I did when I started EOS Worldwide because I knew the concept. Some will start at the beginning. Some can't do it until they hit a million, some 10 million. I have one client that did not hire their integrator until they hit $100 million in revenue. So it's a different answer for everyone, but this is baked into the content because for any visionary entrepreneur listening right now, you've got to decide where and when is the right time to bring on your integrator. Read Rocket Fuel for more insight on that. Now you t- started talking about you know what you're built for. This is so important. I really want to go here, and I and I hope your listeners will have fun with this because going back to Glimpse, you know, as I share in Glimpse, I'm showing that entrepreneur in the making a glimpse of what their life could look like and all of the options. And when I talk about a existing successful entrepreneur that reads the book and gets lit up and makes some tweaks and course corrections, one of the big parts is in what I'm about to share. And so I created a tool called My Biz Match. Okay, and the idea behind that tool and my discovery in writing this and something that just kind of came into my brain in a flash is every entrepreneur is built for a certain type of business. Every entrepreneur will not succeed in every business. It's one of the biggest misnomers and the biggest mistakes that an entrepreneur that is successful in this business sells that business and goes starts a completely different business and fails. And so the point is when you're starting a business, there are 10,000 options. The fallacy that the billion dollar tech unicorn is like the only kind of business to build is maddening to me because there's no shame in building a $5 million heating and cooling company that throws off a 20% profit. So the point here is if we now go through the list and you think about all of the possible industries that exist, and then from there we look at, are you more of a product ser- product person or a service person? Fundamentally, those two businesses could not be more different and we're all drawn to one or the other. It's really hard to be both. I'm a service person. And then we go another level deeper. Are you a B2B entrepreneur or a B2C entrepreneur? Those are very, very different business models. Then we get into pricing. Are you high price, high value, low volume, or are you low price, low volume? I've got one client, they sell light bulbs. I've got another client that they're selling their hourly rate at $1,000 an hour. And so the point is we're all built for something different. And then we get to how big of a company do you want to build to your point? Because there are some entrepreneurs, you're built for building a million dollar company and there's no shame in that. And you're, and there are others that are built for a billion dollar company. Not every entrepreneur is built for a billion dollar company. And what I'm trying to do with this book is to get you to realize what you're built for. And so that tool, My Biz Match, it resides on the website, it's free. And you literally click through a bunch of answers and out pops the perfect business for you. So me, I'm a service guy, high price. I always want to be the most expensive guy in town. I me, hate me too. Products. <laughs> I hate products. I hate inventory. It overwhelms me to see a million dollars of inventory sitting on the shelf. And I, you know, when I look at the businesses, I'm a, I'm a 50 to 250 employee kind of a guy, you know. And so when you talk about seven millions, your number, I have a friend that has built ten, three $10 million companies. 
He tried to build a $100 million company and he failed. We're all built for something different. And so there's no shame at the end of the day if, you know, if your niche, your gift, you're built for $7 million, building $7 million companies, amen and hallelujah, because, you know, you're already damn near one in a million just building a $7 million company. So long dissertation, but man, did that that prompt a lot for me, but also hopefully help your listeners and viewers. Yeah, that's awesome. I'll, I'll yeah, so great, so great. Now, one phrase that I've heard a number of times that I'm curious what your opinion is on it's it's the lifestyle business, right? It's mm-hmm. like I want to have a lifestyle business. I want to be able to travel and work ten hours a week and not. Yeah, you know, just not have the grind of a, a, a regular business where you're the last to get paid or the one who doesn't get paid or the one who takes the least amount of vacation or never gets vacation. They want a lifestyle business. Or conversely, somebody who uh, say, says this as a derogatory thing. Yeah, th- I'm, I'm not one of those lifestyle business owners. I'm not going to uh, just be sitting on the beach all day. I'm going to build something of real value. So I'm curious where you're at with this whole conversation. Uh, be still my heart. I love that question. So, um, so on that exact question, there's something I write about in the book and illustrate, and I'm going to teach it all right here and now called the entrepreneurial range. Okay. And if you picture this range, this arc on the right side of the range, I put true entrepreneurs. On the far left end of the range, I put self-employed, okay? And so anybody that owns a business and or is self-employed is somewhere on that entrepreneurial range. These six essential traits I'm describing are the people on the right side of the range. And so if you think about redlining the right side, these are the greatest entrepreneurs of all time. Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, Oprah Winfrey, Sarah Blakely, Elon Musk. These are the far right. If we go all the way to the far left, self-employed, these are the lifestyle businesses, the freelancers, the solopreneurs, the one person shows. There is no shame in being any of that. But what I'm saying is that person that does want the lifestyle business, amen and hallelujah. You're taking a risk. You're self-employed. I'm not going to call you a true entrepreneur with all due love and respect because my definition is that a true entrepreneur is on the right side of that range. But I will tell you, yes. The people on the right side of the range are are probably going to say something condescending about the lifestyle entrepreneur. And yes, the lifestyle entrepreneur is probably going to say something. So let's not even get into that. The point is, no matter where you are, it's all admirable. But it's the ones on the left side that probably don't have all six essential traits because it's almost impossible for a true entrepreneur to have a lifestyle business because they can't turn off their mind. They see so many opportunities to solve problems and make money that they just find themselves, you know, with employees, with great products and services. They can't stop themselves. I swore before EOS Worldwide, I was not going to build another organization. And, you know, it, it within, I don't know, a very short period of time, I was building another organization. You just can't stop yourself. So does that context help answer your question? It does. Yes, I like that a lot. Well, that, that also prompts me to ask another question because I've learned from Tony Robbins. I attended a lot of his uh, seminars over the years and did his Platinum Partnership. So he describes that there are three types of people in business. They're the entrepreneurs, then they're manager leaders, and then they're the artists. And he convinced me, and I'm sure many of us in the room, that we were actually artists and not entrepreneurs. I mean, mm. I I do still identify as an entrepreneur personally, but maybe I'm more of an entrepreneurial artist. I love inventing stuff. I love uh, tinkering and reverse engineering and poking and prodding at at the black box, whatever it is. If it's a Google algorithm, if it's like when I was a kid, I scrounged my own satellite dish when you know people had these huge, I don't know. 50 feet satellite dishes that were solid and uh, not even mesh. And, and it was fun to try and find one for free that somebody was throwing out to replace with a mesh one and trying to scrounge a, a receiver for free and everything. This was in the 90s. And uh, yeah, I just love figuring that sort of stuff out. So, 
am I an artist? Am I an entrepreneur? Am I, I'm definitely not a manager leader. I'm, I, I do okay <laughs> with that, but that's not my gift. And my team knows it. My team knows that uh, they have to be very self-sufficient in order to thrive in my organization. But I, I'm curious what your take is on all yeah, this. That, yeah, that's, that's really good. And so I, you know, let's, let's, um, do a process of elimination here, okay? Because that entrepreneur he describes and that manager he describes, there's that perfect visionary integrator combo, right? In other words, to just kind of oversimplify that. So now that leaves this artist, as he calls it, you know, I call it the inventor, but it's all the same. And so that, that artist point is so important because rarely does the artist or inventor ever build a business. Because I think I have a lot of that in me, but at the end of the day, I'm an entrepreneur. So when you think of influencers and musicians and actors and, you know, and then the people you say that like to tinker in the lab and create stuff, very few of them are true entrepreneurs. Very few of them really build a business with people in it. They all generate a lot of money, you know, or I should say many of them generate a lot of money. Most of them are starving, many of them, you know, but a lot of them obviously make a lot of money. So I do agree with him from that standpoint that there is that outlier and, and, and that is a real thing. And you have to decide, you know, in fact, is that what you are? But I, I couldn't agree with him more. With that said, the inventor artist that decides to take their leap is almost always over here on the left side of that entrepreneurial range. They're typically a one person show. Again, that influencer is generating 250 grand a year off what they're doing, but it's just them and maybe an assistant. They tend to be more on the left side of the spectrum if they go become self-employed because a lot of them go become inventors and artists for other organizations, corporations, hopefully that makes sense. Right, so they become a name on a patent uh, that makes IBM or Google or whoever richer, but you know that's just kind of a, a, an ego thing that doesn't really pan out for uh, you know their their retirement or whatever. So yeah, and it's sadly, you know, most inventors and artists die broke. I mean, it's 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 a pretty sad state of affairs, frankly, because they just they're geniuses. And they just never, I don't say never, most of the time they just don't know how to monetize their genius. Yeah. Yeah. Well, didn't Nikola Tesla die penniless? I believe so. Yeah. That's such a shame. So yeah. um, this idea of you know figuring out your fit, if you're the manager leader, you're, you know, in your terminology, that would be the integrator. And if you are the, the inventor or in uh, the other terminology, the artist, and then the entrepreneur, which um, the way that Tony described it is like an entre- a true entrepreneur would be happy to swap out their services business for a toilet manufacturing business if the numbers worked out you know, much better. It's like, wow, this is a vastly more profitable business. I'm going to start manufacturing toilets. Uh, they're, they're not wedded to creating this art right? Whether it's a service or a product or whatever that they're like, yeah, toilets, that's fine. And it, it, would you agree with that? Or would you say that well, it, it so, sounded uh, like there was some, some dis like uh, a, a little uh, different opinion there from you with the types of entrepreneurs. Like, I don't think I'm uh, as good of a fit for products as I am for services, though I do, did invent a product that we applied for a patent and everything. And that generated a lot of revenue and we were able to charge on a cost per, per click basis for SEO services because it was such a great software as a service product. And then the company got acquired. So I, I do have the chops to invent products and create a, a product based business that appears to be a services business from the outside. But I gravitate more, much more towards services. So maybe there's some dis, like uh, a little disagreement here about. Uh, the nuances here. What do you think? So again, I'm just going back to, I'm trying to take it back to that entrepreneurial entrepreneurial range. And I'm saying that, yes, some inventors and artists will fall somewhere on that range, more of them to the left. I yeah. would say most of them to the left. You know, and again, I'm not going to debate Tony on his concept because I agree with that concept. 
I believe most of the artists and inventors never take the self-employed leap is the point I'm trying to make there. Right. And the point about an entrepreneur, you know, that'll literally wipe everything out and sell toilets because that's where the money is, where I don't entirely agree with that is it goes back to what we already talked about. What are you built for? And absolutely, an entrepreneur is going to turn their business on a dime. What, an, what a great entrepreneur does is they know their customers and clients better than they know themselves. They have their ear to the ground. They evolve with the times and they keep providing them value. When they make that shift, it's ten, it tends to generally be in the same ball game because that's what they're built for. You know, rarely are they going to go from you know, being a service-based training company to selling hot dogs on the corner stand. I mean, it's just never going to, it's it's rarely going to be that extreme. So I think pretty much we agree, but uh, there that would be my answer. Okay, got it. Now, I'm also curious, I'm thinking of another uh, thought leader, expert, author, and this is Michael Gerber, who has been a guest on this podcast talking about the entrepreneurial delusion, how most people who are uh, supposedly entrepreneurs are delusional about it. They're, they're, they're not running uh, a true business. They're self-employed. They're, uh, they're not uh, a business owner. They're working in the business, not on it, that sort of stuff. And what he recommends in the E-Myth and the E-Myth Revisited and uh, Beyond the E-Myth, all, all those books, is to start with start fresh with a new business a new entity it could even be like a skunk works type entity inside of your your big business and that that entity has a new set of rules that's truly entrepreneurial because trying to go back and fix a business that has been around for five ten years whatever it has and then retrofit in all these new processes and procedures and and a new way of being accountable and all that very hard to do start from the beginning with a new entity what are your thoughts on that well you know so that's interesting so i don't know if you're going to take me through every thought leader that ever lived and <laughs> have me debate them, i'll but, stop uh, here but yeah, yeah, yeah. i will say this about michael gerber i am one of his biggest fans I devoured all of his content in my 20s. He is the reason I was able to turn that family business around. I was armed with his book. I'm, uh, like I said, a huge fan. I actually had the privilege of having a con two conversations with him in the last 60 days. Um, I love that man and his work is incredible. And, and again, so his concept of, it's called an entrepreneurial seizure, by the way. And so that's oh, right, when right. the technician, <laughs> it's when the technician thinks that they're an entrepreneur and takes that entrepreneur leap and fails horribly. And that, you know, that validates my point that not everybody's cut out to be an entrepreneur. And he talks about the three people in every organization. There's the entrepreneur, the manager, and the technician. And again, what I'm teaching is that entrepreneur. So yeah. he and I largely agree. You know, right now he does believe that he can turn anybody in, into an entrepreneur. And that's where we maybe disagree a little bit. But to reinvent your business, that's what I had to do with the family business, armed with his book and ironically the book Reengineering the Corporation, I think it was called. It was those two books. So absolutely, I borderline had to build that business from the ground up. But not every business needs to be completely reinvented to that level. Right, right. Although All right, who, th th who these days, <laughs> no, no, uh, nobody else. But these days, <laughs> it seems like uh, if a company is going to be pushed to the brink to reinvent itself, it's going to be... Uh, with the times that we're in, with the pandemic and and the, uh, cool. I think this is going to be a great depression. That's my that, that's that, that's that's my prognosis, prediction, whatever. Uh, it's going to be a lot bigger than a recession. I don't know. It might even be bigger than the Great Depression of the nineteen mm twenties, -hmm. thirties. Uh, um, yeah, well, I I certainly hope you're wrong, and I'm not smart I enough hope, to predict. I that. hope so too. <laughs> like, yeah, like I said, what I'm finding is half the business owners I'm talking to are thriving, half are getting their ass kicked. And of the ones that are getting their ass kicked, I find that most of them just need to get back to the basics. And yes, then there are some that have to totally reinvent themselves from the ground up. You're 100% right. And many will not be able to do that. They're not capable of doing that. And sadly, those businesses will go out of business. But you yeah. know, that part we... So do you think that uh, folks who are just booming right now with their businesses because of uh what's happening and do you think they would 
get value out of reading this book or, or to be more about EOS? Because I'm thinking, like, for example, I'm going through this list of fastest growing categories in e-commerce. I'm looking at this right now. It's, uh, mm-hmm. it's on stackline.com. Disposable go- uh, gloves, bread machines, coffin cold, soups, dried grains and rice, packaged goods, fruit cups, weight training, milk and cream, dishwashing supplies, paper towels, sand soap and sanitizer, pasta, vegetable. Uh, a lot of categories requiring people to stock up and, and you know, f- fill up their, their bunker or whatever, and also to work from home. So I've got a, a, a client in, in the uh, uh, computing space. They, they have all these uh, options for upgrading your, your Macintosh with uh, you know, more memory and, and more hard drive space and so forth. So they're going like gangbusters. But every one of my clients is just kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. So they are looking at cost-cutting measures, too. They're not just saying, wow, we're 20% up year over year or 30%. Let's just crush it and just like do things that nobody else is willing to do. No, they're also looking at making cuts, too. And that would make me think that the next logical step in, in this would be to look for opportunities to reinvent, right? If you're a business that has 1,000 people and they all work from your company headquarters, maybe it's time to become a virtual uh, company, remote workforce, and it's not just for the next several months or six months, or I would predict 12 to 18 months, but in actuality, maybe it's permanent. Maybe they reinvent themselves to become a virtual business. I don't know. I'm just prognosticating, but it seems to me like maybe this book could be quite helpful for them thinking about how to reinvent and re-engineer? Well, so uh, yes would be the short answer. The longer answer is, again, it depends on who they are in those examples I laid out with the 50-50 because probably most of those companies, it's EOS and traction because they've just simply got to get back to the basics. And I also think it's really dangerous for you to prescribe one size fits all. Hey, everybody go become virtual. So So that's dangerous. And mm. I don't do predictions. In other words, <laughs> yeah. I, get, I get most of them wrong. But here's what, here's what I know and believe. If we look at a thousand years of business history and the next thousand years, there are a couple constants, okay? And so I call it the things that change and the things that don't change. And so one thing that's ever changing is the product and the service that we provide. Number two is the way we communicate and and persuade people to buy our wares. And so 200 years ago, it was beaver pelts and buggy whips, okay? Mm -hmm. And and God only knows what it's going to be 200 years from now, but it's, you know, going to be telepathy and populating Mars. I mean, I don't know, but it's ever changing. And you and I, with all due love and respect, maybe you are the most intelligent man on earth, cannot predict predict. what what the next great product or service is. But that's the beauty of a true entrepreneur who has these six essential traits. They're going to figure it out. And so the product or service is ever changing. And as I keep saying, that entrepreneur that keeps their ear to the ground, stays close to the customer, finds out what they need, is going to make that change. Please don't wait for the other shoe to drop. Stay close to your customer see the shoe dropping. Um, and, and and then again, methods of communication change. So, you know, going back 100 years ago, it was telegraph, then telegram, Pony Express, fax machines, phone call, you know, so, it's, and then again, it's going to be telepathy going forward. So those things are always, what doesn't change is that people have wants and needs and entrepreneurs are going to constantly capitalize on solving their wants and needs, solving their problems for a profit, as Joe Polish says, um, and so with that, I'm just I'm not smart enough to say what the next great business is. But if you're aware of all of those things, do all of those things and have those six essential traits, because with all due love and respect, if you inherited the family business and you're the second generation and you've been coasting for 11 years and you don't have the six essential traits, the odds are pretty good. You're probably about to go out of business with all due love and respect because Family businesses don't endure generations. The statistics, 34% of the first generation survive, uh, something like 13% of the third generation, and like 3% of the fourth. 
is because that second, third, and fourth generation does not have that entrepreneurial spirit. So again, I'm just making a point that we just got to constantly evolve. And there's my impassioned uh, answer and plea to your comment. Okay, awesome. So let's say, and, and this is interesting too, because I, I have three daughters that are grown and I've been trying to get them to be entrepreneurial and uh, two of them have started businesses and are operating them. Uh, one actually in my same industry in, in SEO, that's my oldest, she started doing SEO and blogging and, and uh, affiliates and stuff and things at uh, 14 years old. She had her first wow. website at 14 and uh, started speaking at conferences at 16. So wow. yeah, pretty cool. And uh, I'm, I'm sure if I would have had your book back then, it would I could have been uh, even more... Uh, effective at um, kind of arming her for success. So she's 28 now. She's she's an SEO consultant. She's been on MSNBC talking about SEO and stuff, which is pretty darn cool. Um, so cool. Yeah. And, and so what would you tell uh, my listener who has a child or a loved one, a, a, a spouse, a, a, a parent, a sibling, somebody who they might have that uh, ability to start a business and run it and grow it and so forth. What would you tell them to do to help that person? Like maybe it's me yeah. <clears throat> 20 uh, years yeah. ago uh, yeah. trying to convince and, and assist my daughter, my oldest, on getting her business going or like kind of thinking differently about like passive income instead of just trading uh, hours for dollars. Yeah, sure. Two thoughts come to mind, two mm -hmm. things. Uh, the first is I would direct them to the website and have them take the assessment. Yep. So again, have your niece, nephew, son, daughter, spouse, significant, other, whoever this person is in your life, have them go to the assessment, you know, text them or email them the link and have them fill out the assessment, get their gears turning a bit. And I would also, and this is all in the first answer, give them those the free chapter. So again, there's nine free tools on the website. I'm just touching on two right now. Um, give them that free chapter, the first 30 pages of the book, because that's gonna pull them right in if in fact they're an entrepreneur in the making. Second thing I would do is read the book yourself. And so if you really wanna understand your child that is an entrepreneur in the making, this is the best way to do it, read this book because you know it always pains me when very conservative parents are raising an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You know, It's like the two doctors that are raising the kid that doesn't wanna be a doctor and they're making them be a doctor. I mean, it's like, it's oh, it's a crime. Yes. And so there's these, these wild and crazy entrepreneurs with very conservative parents that don't understand ADD and this gift and they're like, destroying this poor kid well read the book so you understand the gift that your son or daughter really has and it will just help you understand them better and so those would be the two prescriptions and solutions i would have or suggestions i would have for that person yeah yeah that really uh, struck a nerve when you're saying like the two d uh, doctors that are trying to raise a doctor uh their, their child to be a doctor that just Makes goes sense. against everything right that's uh, about conscious parenting i'm actually listening to the audiobook the conscious parent oh, it's great I'm, I'm loving it i've got a brand new uh baby <laughs> uh seven month old uh son now so uh, i'm going to be doing this all over again and we'll see if he's an entrepreneur or or what it will you know what he wants to do but i'm just going to be there for him to help him to discover what that is and and not force him down some path <laughs> Here, here. You know, you prompt two thoughts. Number one, I was lucky enough growing up. My parents gave me and us so much freedom. Um, and, and I couldn't imagine what my life would have been like if I were under the thumb and had the kind of structure that some of these parents put on their kids. I mean, I, I can't even imagine. It would not have been pretty. And so I was fortunate enough to have a very entrepreneurial father. Um, and mother who just gave me so much rope to go be free. And the other thing it reminds me of in this story is right in the book is the client of mine that has built a $250 million company. Well, he was going to medical school. His parents were making him become a doctor and it was about a year or two in when he called in and he started a cleaning company and he said, mom, I'm not gonna be a doctor. 
Uh, I'm dropping out and I'm going to go clean toilets. So imagine what those parents thought when they heard that message. They became very supportive, but you know, listen, at the end of the day, you got to let your birdies fly and, and every person needs to let their freak flag fly, in my opinion. We're all cut out and gifted to do something and we just need to do it. Yeah, I like that. So uh, one thing that I recently did, I should have done ages ago, but I did just in the last oh, six months, was take the Colby assessment. So I, mm. now, I now know my, uh, my, my four numbers. And not surprisingly, I'm massive on, on quick start, which is uh, oh, yeah. nine out of 10 for me. I'm curious where Colby fits in for you into your EOS framework, into the uh, entrepreneurial leap framework and, and all the tools that you've developed. Is this like an essential adjunct? To, uh, is this something that you uh, also highly endorse do you uh, have your Colby scores and all that? Or is it something that's just another way of looking things? Just like you yeah, have predictive index and disk and um, uh, strengths finder and, and the fascinate index and all that sort of stuff. I highly, highly, highly endorse Colby. So yeah. uh, Colby is one of the 20 tools in the EOS process that we teach all of our clients. And, and I absolutely write about Colby in one of the chapters in this book because you mentioned that quick start. It's one of the greatest indicators of an entrepreneur and that you have these six essential traits is when you're an eight, nine, or 10 quick start. In, in all of my experience with entrepreneurs, high 90% of them are all eight, nine, 10 quick starts. Yeah. So huge supporter, believer. I'm an eight quick start. Um, so yep. yeah, I'm a... Big believer. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I, I I thought you might be, and I have threes for all my other uh, scores in in Colby, so uh, I I guess that makes me a good simplifier. But uh, being able to gather all the data and imp go through all the implementation and see everything through to the finish and stuff, yeah, that's not me. <laughs> That makes that Colby makes you a handful, is what that does. And so you, <laughs> yes, I am a handful you, for my team. You definitely, you definitely need an integrator, or you need some high follow throughs around you. That's the second mode in Colby. You need high follow throughs, and you'll look amazing. So, so you need that integrator. You need those high follow throughs, and all of your ideas and projects will get executed, and you'll look like a genius. So that's the real secret, you know. I. So I was doing a podcast talking about one of my secrets. I'm a great delegator. You know, it's, I'm, I'm so comfortable delegating. I have no issues around delegating. And so I describe it as, you know, I just have always had great wingmen and wing women around me, you know, going all the way back to dating and all the way forward to building a business. I just have great people around me that do a lot of the heavy lifting and make me look really good. And so that's, that's what you need. And, uh, and yeah, that's a wild and crazy Colby you got there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, it is. Do you, Which, have, by the way, is, is you know, like 80% of all of my visionary entrepreneur clients. So you're in good company. Okay. I feel better now. All right. So uh, any other assessments that you really like? I, I rattled off a bunch, like StrengthsFinder and so forth. I'm, I, I, I quite like StrengthsFinder. Um, you know, there's DISC, there's Predictive Index, there's... Uh, uh, what wealth dynamics? I think uh, there's that one. I don't know, but but every one that you just rattled off. So Colby is at the absolute top of the list. Yeah, and then everything you just rattled off, including culture index, are kind of all number twos for me. Because Myers Briggs is another great one. You know, I write an entire chapter called Know Thyself, and and it is vital that everyone listening you know, take these profiling tools, know thyself, know your strengths and weaknesses and build a life around that. So Colby's at the top, the rest are great seconds. And I have clients that use every single one that you just described and they love them. In other words, I'm not saying they all use all of them. I'm saying these 10 clients use the first one you said, and these 10 use the second one and they all swear by them. So it's like, it's the rest are like on this neutral ground, all great. And you tend to get drawn to your favorite one. So there's not one perfect one other than Colby uh, for this kind of work, but uh, they're, they're all great. I'm a, a disc, you know, I know my disc, I know my strengths finder, I know my Myers-Briggs. I'm a fanatic about profiling tools. And fortunately, I discovered them at 25 years old and never looked back. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I, I, I'm 
right with you on that. Cool. So what's next for you? Like, So the book is out. Are you going to build a big empire like you did with EOS around these new uh, nine tools and the essential traits and everything? Uh, like, where's the next step for you? Or where, where's maybe the en- end game? Yeah, I appreciate that. So the ultimate end, end game is to impact a million entrepreneurs in the making and, you know, give them a huge jump start. And I'll never say never, but I really don't want to build another empire. And I said that 20 years ago before I built EOS Worldwide, which was an empire. And so we'll see what happens. Again, I'll never say never. But I am going to build something of a quasi empire from a standpoint of I'm, I'm taking a very unique and different approach to this model. OK, and so the plan is to build this through collaborators. I call them collaborators. And so my team is four people. So I have a team of four people. And what I say is I have four people right now and they're all virtual. In 10 years from now, I want four virtual people. I don't want to build an empire. Collaborators are any organization or person that are currently helping entrepreneurs in the making. So imagine high school teachers and professors and for profits and nonprofits. So anyone that's teaching and mentoring and guiding and helping entrepreneurs. What I do with these collaborators is I give them my content for free. They give credit where credit's due, and it's this match made in heaven. So they get to be heroes to their audience. And so, you know, right now I sit here with about 20 committed collaborators. I literally have 80 that I'm talking to. And my goal over the next three years is to have 50 committed collaborators. And I'm just going to keep building those collaborators and and build this um, community of collaborators that we're all passionate about the same thing that are using the content. And, and, you know, so if, you know, I don't need another empire, I don't need, (laughs) you know, trillions of dollars. And so if I were you know, wanting to, I could flip this into an economic model and charge for all that. But I just, this is a passion project and there are no contracts with those collaborators. There's no money that exchanges hands. I am giving them the content and I believe it's going to be a win-win and we're all going to win and we're going to impact a million people over the next 10 years. So that's what's next. And I can't tell you what comes in the next 10 years, but uh, I mean the 10 years after that, but right now I'm just hyper-focused on this 10 year plan. Well, telepathy is the, the thing after that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and populating Mars. So those two things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, a two collaborator collaborators I can think of that you should definitely talk to. One is Dr. Bill Dorfman. He's the founder of leap foundation. They do a lot for, for kids, getting them inspired to start an entrepreneurial journey. Mm-hmm. He puts on great, great, great events. And, uh, Steve Glaveski, who's been a guest mm-hmm. on this show, and he is mm. the founder of Lemonade Stand. And Lemonade ah. Stand is uh, helping young entrepreneurs, kids wow. to... Uh, wow. Yeah, so that would be uh, my recommendation for you on uh, well, if, collaborators. If you could please connect us. That I would, would, be I awesome. would love to. I would love to. Okay. And, 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 and listeners, if those uh, two folks sound interesting to you, check them out. And those two... Uh, resources or organizations, Lemonade Stand and Leap Foundation. I'll put those into the show notes as well as all the stuff we've been talking about for this past hour, all, all the great resources, tools, books, and everything that we've discussed will go on the show notes for this uh, for this episode. So if, if um, you were to maybe leave our listener with one last piece of wisdom that we didn't already discuss... Mm. What would that be? Yeah. So I would say um, I write an entire chapter on this. And it's something that's been the most transformative in my life in the last 18 years now. So I learned this at 35 years old and it's 10 year thinking. And so um, so I write an entire chapter basically saying take action, but be patient. And the whole idea is you got to move towards something. And the point here is the faster you can shift your thinking to 10 year thinking, everything should be thinking in 10 year time frames. What it did for me is all of a sudden time slowed down. I started making better decisions and ironically I got there faster. Mm. So it's, it's just, it's this crazy kind of counterintuitive oxymoron, but I would urge shift your thinking to 10 year thinking because prior to that, everything was now, now, now. I wanted everything to get done now, this year. And I would make these short term decisions that would hurt me in the long run. So 10 year thinking is what I would leave you with. 
Awesome. And you you came up with this at age 35. What is the most impactful thing that came out of applying 10-year thinking out of these last, uh, what, 17 years? Is that right? Well, I would say the biggest is that we have almost 100,000 companies using the EOS tools. Yeah. So, uh, so I think that was it. And, and, and the overriding goal has always been that we EOS implementers take 10,000 companies through our process by the end of 2020. And ironically, I set that goal almost 20 years ago, and, and we're going to hit that goal. I never realized the exponential reach that those 10,000 would have. And so literally, we'll be well over 100,000 companies. And so again, with that long-term thinking like that and the commitment to that goal, it just enabled me and us to make much better now decisions, knowing that every decision was all about getting there. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about long-term thinking. I, I, I think it was maybe Peter Diamandis who suggested we think in terms of 100-year goals. Yeah. And Dan Sullivan is talking about 25 years and certainly... Uh, the Japanese think 100-year planning. Yeah, so listen, I'm just trying to get people to go past one year to 10 years. And obviously yeah. the woman you shared earlier, she's getting people to think three years, anything that gets people thinking further out. So I'll get them to thinking 10, and then Dan can take them to 25, and then Peter can take them to 100. We'll all play <laughs> our part. Okay, awesome. All right, and so again, the website for the book is e-leap.com. And if somebody wanted to follow you and... I don't know, maybe invite you on their podcast. Uh, uh, like, where can they best find you online? Uh, are you active on any social platforms? Uh, do you have another website that you want to direct people to as well? No, so we're on all the social platforms, but if you go to that website, e-leap.com, that's the epicenter of everything. That's where you'll see all the social, you know, use the one that works for you. That's how you can reach out to me. That's how you can reach out to us. So it's all there. Really simple and intuitive. Awesome. Thank you, Gina. This was just uh, incredible. I, I've i been a fan of, of of what you've been doing since I ever since I heard of you, and that was maybe a year and a half ago. So, uh, yeah, amazing to have Gina Wickman on the podcast. Thank you again. And thank you, listener. Please do something with this. Inspire somebody, even if you already are uh, having great success as an entrepreneur, Find somebody that you can lift them up, give them a hand, Thanks. give them the book, uh, learn the concepts and apply it to the people who need it. Catch you on the next episode. This is Stefan Spencer, your host, signing off.